The Media Institute, the foremost independent advocate for the First Amendment for over four decades, is one of the nation's leading nonpartisan organizations focused on media and communications policy. The Media Institute promotes freedom of speech, recognizes excellence in journalism, and encourages a competitive media environment and communications industry. Considering the current state of affairs in the nation's capital and across the country, our mission is more relevant than ever. Thanks to our sponsors and supporters. At the platinum level, AT&T, Charter Communications, Consumer Technology Association, iHeartMedia, LG Electronics USA, Tegna, Verizon Communications, and Viacom CBS. Our gold sponsors include America's public television stations, CTIA, Everything Wireless, Education Networks of America, Interactive Advertising Bureau, National Association of Broadcasters, NBC Universal, and NCTA, the Internet and Television Association. Silver sponsors include ACA Connects, America's Communications Association, Advanced Television Systems Committee, ATSC, Cooley LLP, Corporation for Public Broadcasting, Covington and Burling, LLP, Cox Enterprises, Inc., Davis Wright Tremaine, LLP, DLA Piper, Lerman Center, PLLC, News Media Alliance, T-Mobile, U.S. Telecom, Wiley, and Wilkinson Barker Nauer, LLP. Thanks to all for making today's event possible. And now the president and CEO of the Media Institute, Rick Kapler. Hey, good afternoon, and welcome to our Communications Forum virtual luncheon for May. Thank you for being with us. And special thanks to our luncheon sponsors. You know, we couldn't put on these events without you. We have a great program for you today, but let me take just a moment to tell you about our speaker coming up next month. On June 22nd, we'll welcome Gary Shapiro, President and CEO of the Consumer Technology Association. Gary has been one of our most popular luncheon speakers over the years, and we look forward to his latest insights on innovation, competition, and what lies ahead for the tech industry. That'll be Tuesday, June 22nd. Before I introduce today's speaker, I'd like to pause and remember a very special friend we lost on April 4th. Kurt Wimmer was not only an exceptional lawyer with Covington, but he was a wonderful friend and supporter of the Media Institute. Kurt was our longtime board member and treasurer and served as chairman of our First Amendment Advisory Council for more than 10 years. He wrote many book chapters, court briefs, and policy papers for us as well. Kurt was always someone I could turn to for advice and help, and he was a terrific friend. He left us far too early, and we miss him. Turning now to today's program, it is my great honor and pleasure to introduce our speaker. Commissioner Jeffrey Starks was unanimously confirmed as an FCC commissioner in January 2019. Shortly after that, he was the featured speaker at our Free Speech America Gala in October of 2019. So we're especially glad to welcome him back today as our luncheon speaker. Commissioner Starks has a long career of public and private sector experience. Most recently, he served as Assistant Bureau Chief in the FCC's Enforcement Bureau, where he focused on protecting consumers, promoting network security, and preserving the integrity of the Commission's Universal Service Fund programs. Previously, he served as Senior Counsel in the Office of the Deputy Attorney General at the U.S. Department of Justice. At DOJ, he received the Attorney General Award for Exceptional Service the highest award a DOJ employee can receive. Prior to his federal service, Commissioner Starks practiced law at Williams and Connolly. Before that, he clerked on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Eighth Circuit, served as a legislative staffer in the Illinois State Senate, and worked as a financial analyst. Commissioner Starks is a Midwesterner who was born in Kansas City, Missouri. He earned a bachelor's degree with high honors from Harvard College and a law degree from Yale Law School. In just a little over two years at the FCC, Commissioner Starks made a name for himself as a champion of equality and opportunity for every American, especially those on the wrong side of the digital divide who lack access to high quality broadband. In addition, he has taken a leadership role in the academic realm by hosting two roundtable panel discussions 
with the presidents of historically black colleges and universities where they discussed affordable technology solutions that would benefit students, faculty, staff, and local communities during the pandemic. Let me remind you that during Commissioner Stark's presentation, you'll have a chance to ask questions using the ask a question feature on your screen. Just type your questions and send them in and we'll have a good Q&A session with the commissioners after the commissioner's presentation. Right now, it's my distinct privilege to welcome our very distinguished guest, FCC Commissioner Jeffrey Starks. Well, thank you so much for that introduc introduction, Rick, uh, and for hosting me here this afternoon. I hope for all of you out there uh, that you're enjoying a nice lunch uh, as well. And so truly uh, honored to join you for this virtual luncheon. Uh, it's a critical time in our industry and of course uh, in our nation. We have collectively been through so much since the last time I spoke before this group in what I uh, have come to affectionately call the time before. Uh, and for me, uh, it is, of course, still opaque in what ways we will and will not uh, ultimately be able to get back to our uh, pre-pandemic lives. And so uh, you all remember it uh, when we used to shake hands with strangers, greet friends with hugs, revel in dinner parties, and even drop our kids off for play dates. Those were the days. And so now we're all trying to figure out what the post-COVID new normal will look like. Of course, we at the FCC are still working from home like many of you probably are. Like millions of American households as well, my spouse and I, uh, my spouse is working from home uh, and we're juggling the duties that include home school for our two young learners. And so uh, they use the word hybrid uh, and it has never been more apt. And so I wanted to, take a little bit of time this afternoon to talk about my priorities. Uh, and so offer up uh, both in the context of our larger new normal, and of course, in the context of the start of a new administration, uh, some of my thoughts, priorities, and ideas. And so uh, let me start where I should as my top priority for the year, which really should be a surprise to no one, is continuing the work that we have been laser focused on already this year. And that is making sure that all Americans have access to high speed broadband. Here in two of our, uh, here in this year, we've had uh, uh, battles continuing with COVID-19 and the pandemic. And so we're enduring the lingering effects across a multi-layered crisis that has truly reverberated across healthcare, education, the economy, widespread job losses and food insecurity. And so I truly do believe, as the late Congressman John Lewis said, that access to the internet is a civil right. In fact, he said it is the civil rights issue of the 21st century. And there are multi-variable reasons why we have Americans that remain disconnected. And I'm not going to visit, there's need, and no need to visit each of them here today. Uh, but for years now, I have focused in particular on the fact that for tens of millions of people across this country, they remain disconnected because they lack access to an affordable broadband connection. And even now, black people and other people of color in America are still by a wide margin, significantly less likely to have that home broadband connection that we know they need than their counterparts. An essential piece of our broadband deployment challenge is creating digital equity, and that means bridging the digital divide and the opportunity divide. There has been a real movement on this front, of course, and legislation in particular has led the way, has required the FCC to sprint. We were given very fast 60-day quick burns uh, on a number of fronts, and so we've worked to implement and administer the emergency broadband benefit to provide discounts to households on the cost of broadband and towards the purchase of a tablet, laptop, or desktop computer from a participating provider. And additionally, uh, in March, Congress passed the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021, which created a $7.17 billion emergency connectivity fund. Just yesterday, May 10th, we voted on rules to provide for the distribution of funding 
there to eligible schools, libraries, so that they can purchase the eligible equipment and services for use at locations other than a school or a library. And so in looking to the future more broadly as well, President Biden has included in his $2.3 trillion infrastructure package known as the American Jobs Plan. He has targeted $100 billion to connect every American to high-speed broadband. So taking a step back, why am I talking to the Media Institute audience about broadband? Well, one simple reason, of course, is that broadband is important to all of us as consumers of media content, much of which is accessed with the help of broadband. Further, it seems like every few months, really, there is a new service or a provider with the potential to cut into the number of those relying on broadcast for their news, entertainment, information. And this has, of course, been accelerated in some ways by the pandemic, where so many other options for live and in-person activities have disappeared. Here's the good news. Broadcasting has always been a steady and reliable resource to Americans. And now more than ever, Americans still rely heavily on broadcast media to navigate the challenges associated with the COVID-19 pandemic. Moreover, television broadcasters seem to be holding their own during this time of crisis. A study late last year indicated that broadcast TV was the most pervasive medium accessed during the pandemic, reaching 84% of Americans that were surveyed. Further, local broadcast TV proved to be the most trusted news source among adults 18 and older. And broadcast news generally was found to provide the best information and updates on COVID-19. Local TV news shows attract 25 million nightly viewers, garnering significantly more attention than national cable programs. Note, the emphasis here is on local. Localism is, of course, one of the pillars that guide the FCC's regulations of broadcasting. And now more than ever, local TV stations must rise to the challenge of continuing to serve local audiences while at the same time navigating the evolving mm. media landscape and managing the evolving needs of their diverse populations and consumers. I note a very recent study by BIA Advisory Services confirming mm. that local news produced by local broadcast stations is, quote, the most trusted, highly consumed and valued news source, close quote. The same, the same study though, also details the strain that technology platforms have placed on the business model through the steady losses of compensation and advertising revenue. The pandemic has had a measurable impact as well uh, on radio stations as demonstrated by a different metric but tells the same story consistent with the trends that have existed for many years because of, again, disruptive technologies and applications uh, like streaming services, satellite radio that have attracted listeners away from traditional broadcast radio. According to the FCC's latest numbers, there has been a pandemic related silent impact on the number of radio stations. Comparing last March to March 2021, there were four fewer licensed commu commercial FM stations, 34 fewer AM stations. So from the beginning of the first quarter of 2021 to the end of the quarter, 17 commercial FMs and five AM stations stopped broadcasting. Perhaps the tide will turn this summer with the planned auction of four AM construction permits and 136 FM construction permits as part of auction 109, scheduled of course to begin on July 27th. And so in my view, the unique ability of radio to target specific audiences where they live and work gives broadcasters a competitive advantage. And I believe that local, local broadcast radio and TV will continue to play an important public interest role for many years to come. Let me turn now uh, to the future of media diversity. Another key pillar of broadcast regulations is of course diversity. At the beginning of this new administration, we have perhaps a unique opportunity to make progress on issues for which the needle has not moved for some time, despite their importance and despite the regulatory and statutory mandates, uh, mandates to address them. I'm specifically talking about the commission's responsibility to promote and ensure diversity 
in media ownership, management, and employment. As a commissioner, I have spent a lot of my time thinking about how to advance diversity in the media industry. The FCC must make sure that every aspect of this industry, from who owns a license, to who makes the decisions in the production room, to who sits in front of the camera, reflects our diversity. And so why is it that diversity is so important? Because what we see here and who we see and hear it from impacts the way we view our world, our society, and ourselves. Several recent stories in the news, just to take a few, have highlighted the extent of the lack of diversity in media and tech and some of those impacts. One recent investigation highlighted allegations that a major television broadcaster had cultivated a hostile work environment that included bullying female managers and blocking efforts to hire and retain black journalists. Closer to home for me personally, in December, the Kansas City Star issued an apology acknowledging that over decades through its news coverage, the paper had, quote, disenfranchised, ignored, and scorned generations of Black Kansas citizens and robbed entire communities of opportunity, dignity, justice, and recognition. The paper further explained why, quote, like most Metro newspapers of the early to mid 20th century, the Star was a white newspaper produced by white reporters and editors for white readers and advertisers, close quote. We've seen other papers, including the LA Times, making similar public apologies. These stories highlight the real and impactful harm that can come from a lack of diversity among those who own, control, and are in the media. Clearly, there is still more work to do to ensure that owners and employees at media companies better reflect the makeup of the communities that they serve. And so uh, focusing on the future of media ownership with regard to the lack of diversity uh, that we see in media ownership, the status of the commission's regulatory efforts had been uncertain, of course, pending the Supreme Court's decision in FCC versus Prometheus. Briefly at issue in that case was the FCC's decision to relax certain ownership limits that it had determined were no longer necessary due to dramatically changed market conditions, including the newspaper broadcast uh, cross ownership rule, the radio television cross ownership rule, and the local television ownership rule. And so the same panel uh, there at the Third Circuit, as I'm sure many of you know, had heard every challenge to the commission's quadrennial review of its media ownership regulations since 2003. And the commission, of course, has repeatedly asserted that it has a statutory duty under Section 202H of the Communications Act to assess the effects of its ownership rules on minority and female ownership, consistent with the agency's traditional public interest goals of promoting competition, localism, and, of course, diversity. The Supreme Court found that the three ownership rules at issue were no longer necessary to serve those uh, agency public interest goals. And of course, that the rule changes were not likely to harm minority and female ownership. However, notably, nothing in the decision disturbed that long established ruling that the commission can take into account how diversity will be affected by our media ownership decisions. And so that's a big win. Uh, for agency deference under the Administrative Procedure Act. That should provide the necessary space for us to revisit our rules with diversity front and center as a consideration. That means we can now move forward confidently to address media ownership in the 2022 quadrennial review. As I noted in a statement uh, concurrent, uh, with the Prometheus decision, we can and should approach this task in a manner that is data driven and otherwise fully consistent with our duty to promote and ensure those, uh, those pillars, competition, localism, and diversity in our search for the public interest. The numbers on ownership diversity, again, as many of you know, I come back to because they indicate that we have real work to do. According to our most recent broadcast ownership data, from 2017, no minority group 
was better off in owning more full power commercial broadcast television stations than they were the last time the data was connected, uh, collected in 2015. So what does that mean? Out of the 1,385 stations, African-Americans own just 12. Two years later, uh, that was uh, just 12 in 2015. And just two years later, they still own just 12. And so again, of those over 1,300 uh, stations, that means African-Americans constitute 0.8% of overall station ownership. Several other minority groups numbers actually got worse when you compare them 2015 to 2017. American Indian or Alaskan Native women lost all eight of their stations in which they held a majority ownership. Women overall lost ground as well, representing only 5.3% of full power uh, commercial uh, stations as owners, down from 7.4% in 2015, despite of course the fact that women make up more than half of our population. And so uh, taking a broader lens as well, the trends of ownership over the last 40 years are striking. In 1983, there were about 50 dominant media companies. I know Mr. Chairman uh, uh, knows about that. Today, there are five media conglomerates that own about 90% of the media in the United States, including newspapers, magazines, movie studios, radio and television. And so this consolidation may not seem problematic if you consider all of the competition these companies face from the internet. Moreover, if you consider more broadly how video streaming services have truly disrupted broadcast television, as I said before, and their viewership in a major way, especially during the pandemic, media consolidation might uh, seem to have a, a less potent impact as well. Nielsen reports, for example, that over the last year, video streaming has increased by 7% over linear TV and video on demand, going from 18% to 25%, of course, with Netflix leading the path. On the other hand, I still come back to the importance of broadcast as a medium because of its pervasiveness, its ubiquity, and because of the fact that the public airwaves belong to all of us. There is an inherent value in allowing many different voices in the public arena. One way to achieve that is encouraging and supporting diversity and independence in our broadcast media outlets. The airwaves that we use to provide broadcasting are a finite public resource. With such a limited number of stations available in each market across the country, there are of course very few opportunities for new entrants to have a real shot at purchasing a station. And so, uh, to close this part here, it's not clear to me whether media consolidation will accelerate following the Prometheus decision, but I certainly have a renewed interest in using the next quadrennial review to ensure that the pillars of diversity, localism, and competition are fully considered in determining what the future of media ownership and regulation look like. We should take a close look at everything and make sure we do what makes sense in today's market. The future of EEO is something that I wanted to turn to and talk with you all about here. Uh, it's just as important that broadcast stations and other media employ managers and staff that reflect the audiences and communities that they serve. The other end of the equation here. Since joining the FCC more than two years ago, I have personally championed the necessity for us to restart the collection of EEO data to help us develop a better understanding of the media workforce. We have a statutory obligation to monitor broadcaster employment practices and ensure that broadcasters provide equal employment opportunities. And our failure to collect EEO data has hampered our ability to, de to determine what regulatory actions are necessary to ensure equal employment opportunities. And so for almost two decades, there has been no collection due in my mind to stale questions about confidentiality and constitutionality. And so you may have heard that the acting chair circulated a notice of proposed rulemaking in NPRM earlier this year to seek comment on restarting the EEO data collection. And I was happy to support that. Again, this is an issue I have personally championed. And so further, I do welcome the debate over whether there are any valid outstanding concerns, constitutional or otherwise, 
about how to proceed with fulfilling our statutory obligation here, yet ensure the promotion of diversity in broadcasting. This inquiry is long overdue, and I hope that we can move quickly in this proceeding in, uh, like I said, short order. One final topic I wanted to turn to here uh, is uh, something that I always keep on top of mind, especially as we figure out the right regulatory path forward on existing media, as well as new technologies. And that is the issue of accessibility. We must always prioritize these concerns uh, to ensure that as technology moves forward, frequently at a breakneck speed, the commission fulfills its obligation to ensure that regulated services and devices are accessible. And so to that end, I am pleased uh, to note that last month we released a public notice inviting comment from all of our stakeholders on whether any updates are needed to our accessibility rules. These are the rules that were initially adopted when the commission implemented the 21st Century Communications and Video Accessibility Act of 2010 the CVAA enacted to help ensure that individuals with disabilities are able to fully utilize communication services and equipment and better access video programming. It covers several areas and statutory objectives in the video programming market, including requirements for access to video programming, closed captioning of internet protocol, delivered video programming, accessibility emergency information, and user interfaces that make functions such as captioning accessible and usable to individuals with disabilities. It also covers audio description, which makes programming more accessible to individuals who are blind or visually impaired by inserting audio narrated descriptions of a television's program's key visual elements into natural pauses between dialogue. And notably, the commission recently adopted rules to extend requirements for broadcasters and other video service programmers to provide audio description for programming in 40 additional marketing areas over the next four years. And so I look forward uh, to the record and developing a record on this important opportunity to update those regulations and ensure that everyone can fully and equally participate in the digital re revolution. And so let me close. Uh, in looking forward, I hope to discuss and focus on the unparalleled opportunity with each of you that this crisis has brought uh, to steering our efforts towards achieving that more fundamental fairness and equality in the media industry as well. Thank you all for the time. Hey, thank you, Commissioner. Fascinating presentation. You touched on a lot of very important areas here and, and certainly uh, good to see the leadership role in, in moving some of these important areas forward. Um, some questions now. And of course, we invite our audience to submit uh, questions as we go along here. Um, now, we, one question has come in here. Do you see policy options for the agency to stem or reverse the trend of closing radio stations beyond uh, auction 109? Uh, you know, I, I think, uh, as I mentioned, you know, auction 109 is set uh, for bidding starting uh, in July with, like I mentioned, the 4 a.m. broadcast construction permits, the 136 um, uh, FM. And so the, the, the public notice has gone out, uh, explained, you know, how bidding is going to go. And so, you know, I, I think auction 109 is a great place to look forward. Uh, and, and I look forward to, to seeing that auction and seeing the results. In terms of avoiding closures, uh, like I said, I have spoken with a number of folks uh, in, in this e ecosystem who, of course, have said uh, how hard uh, the pandemic has been. Uh, and, and that includes the, as I mentioned, you know, the strain that we've already seen uh, on tightening in the business models in a lot of those kind of traditional broadcasts. Um, and so, you know, I think there is, uh, uh, at the end of the day, uh, especially as things start to turn again and people start getting back to their normal routines and driving more, I think uh, you'll start to see that the, the business model will return 
to some pre-pandemic um, uh, ways. I do think radio stations will always have, like I said, an important critical role here in terms of avoiding further closures. You know, I think there's a lot, uh, hopefully that this auction will drive. We'll see how uh, strong the market is, uh, but we'll continue to see how this marketplace evolves. You mentioned during your talk that uh, 21 radio stations had closed during the pandemic. Was there a, a common thread running through the reasons for those closures or um, is there, you know, like, can you put your finger on one particular cause for most of those or a variety of reasons? Yeah, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't proffer anything specific. Uh, you know, again, I, I would say, um, you know, we heard from a number of radio stations in particular, uh, how hard the lack of advertising dollars has been generally but in particular with the pandemic, you had so many businesses, so many small businesses, so many local businesses that otherwise uh, are buying radio time, buying advertising. Obviously, the economy constricted uh, a lot as well. And I think you probably look across the spectrum. You saw a lot of businesses that got hurt a lot. A lot of small businesses got hurt a lot. Uh, I suspect it's, it's, it's a number of uh, all of the above uh, points. But I certainly do think, of course, that the pandemic... Uh, played a role in that as well. Mm -hmm. uh, question from a viewer here. Do you think uh, the TV distance education can help optimize limited broadband connections? For example, um, they download the lecture video by TV broadcast and upload homework by broadband. Yeah, this is nothing that I have uh, uh, qu quite focused on myself. Uh, I do know that this is something that um, uh, a couple of folks have raised uh, with me as we were considering uh, the Emergency Connectivity Fund, ECF. Uh, and, and again, you know, how, how does uh, the role of education come, uh, come, to, come into play here? Uh, and so folks have started to mention this kind of, you know, zone casting uh, a little bit as well. Uh, and so this is something that I, you know, again, I haven't focused on it, uh, but I do think uh, it's something that I'm, I'm interested to learn more and hear more about. And I do know that people are are trying to use this as well as another lever in, in, in us uh, battling what has been a very tough time for young learners. Mm -hmm. now, speaking of the emergency connectivity uh, fund, um, you have said before that uh, you uh, you believe that it was necessary to uh, to collect additional data about students and. Uh, uh, their their needs and so forth. Um, why what was lacking there? What was what, uh, um, why was it so important to collect uh, additional data uh, that was not already being collected? What was different about that, and and uh, and how has that worked out? Yeah, it's it's a great question, Rick. And, and, and you know, to take to take one step back, um, um, you know, I think. Um, uh, in, in a lot of ways, uh, when you're talking about broadband, we are all trying to figure out what is the best way to have a data-driven result here. Uh, when you're talking about the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund, again, in my remarks, I kind of mentioned, you know, the various ways that we see uh, folks lacking their ability to get connected. Um, and so uh, when the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund came out, that is largely an issue of us not necessarily knowing which rural areas have connectivity, which don't. Uh, and so I said, when you look back, we have previously funded through the Universal Service Fund, we have funded uh, connections to areas where we don't know. Uh, we previously funded 4-1 connections, and then we funded 10-3, and then now we're going back and refunding 25-3. And so they're making sure that we have better data that drives our practices is something that I have been focused on. And so when we start to look at the homework gap, uh, as it's so called, uh, you know, uh, which the emergency connectivity fund really was focusing on, school districts at a very local level. Again, it's, it, what we have seen is at the federal level, we have trouble getting that very granular data. But we do know, especially over the course of the pandemic, over the last, um, you know, uh, 18 months here or so, uh, that school districts at a very granular level, level know which students are connected, which students have devices, and which ones don't. Which are the students that the school is going to need to uh, try to get connected? Are we going to need to get them uh, a tablet? Uh, and so making sure that we start to understand that data. 
Uh, and so the emergency connectivity fund, originally the original da draft was not collecting that data. And I thought that was an omission and an oversight that I wanted to correct. And so more accurate information about the number of students without connect connected devices, broadband services is gonna be important. So specifically, um, you know, what I, what I drove to result is as part of the application process, uh, the commission is going to collect schools and school districts best estimates uh, about the number of students in their district uh, who did not have that adequate connected device, that broadband connection, uh, both when the pandemic began, uh, as well as the number of students that are going to benefit from the emergency connectivity fund right now. Uh, and so, you know, the last thing that I would mention is I, I, I included this, as I mentioned, so that we can drive better solutions. I didn't include this as kind of like a gotcha uh, for, uh, for, for schools as they um, uh, tell us what their needs are for their students. Uh, it, you know, this is not going to be part of a, an auction, uh, not an auction, a, uh, an audit uh, a remedy or something like that. It's really more so that we can get better, more granular data on who has and who has not, especially as we're, we're driving solutions uh, in the homework gap uh, area. Yeah, you're right. Good, interesting. Uh, going back now, you, you made a lot of good points about uh, minority ownership and broadcasting. Um, and you also mentioned uh, you know, the emphasis on localism plus the changes in the business model that have resulted in a lot of consolidation. Um, how do you uh, balance uh, you know, this, this tension between the business model, which seems to rely on consolidation to provide uh, you know, economies of scale to flourish economically, versus uh, promoting minority ownership, which may be you know, smaller uh, you know, individual stations here and there and so forth. Uh, how do you make that happen in a practical way, given this business model that's being pushed by you know, big tech requiring so much consolidation? It's a great question, Rick. Uh, and that is exactly you know, what we're gonna be taking up uh, you know, we're certainly going to be taking up these issues in the in the upcoming uh, on a macro level. You know, this will of course impinge on what we are thinking through and and effectuating in a policy way through the quadrennial. Uh, you know, but there are a number of, of factors here. I, I, I do take the point uh, that from the business model, having scalability is an important part to to profitability, uh, especially again with the business landscape having so many. Uh, pressures that are coming in from technology platforms. Uh, you know, on the other hand, uh, you know, as I said plainly, when you look at the numbers, uh, they are anemic. Minority uh, it, diversity in a number of ways for, uh, for African Americans, for, uh, for, for Asian Americans, for women, for folks of color, for, for the Latinx, the numbers truly are anemic. You know, like, like I've said, uh, back when I was looking at the 2015 numbers, uh, you know, compared to, you know, the numerator denominator issue there, uh, you know, if you were rounding how many African Americans owned a full TV, uh, a full power TV station, you would round it to 0%. Uh, that's how bad the numbers were. You know, as I mentioned now, the number is at 0.8%. So, uh, 12 out of 1,385 full power TV stations. And so uh, that is another uh, very plain driver that we have got to do better. Uh, and so these are all issues that we are going to have to work through. Um, uh, it, it, it's, it's important, as I said, uh, for public airwaves to represent and fully lean into our pillars. Uh, and so these are issues that we're going to really have to think through. Hmm. On the other side of the uh, uh, coin, you talked about the future of EEO and uh, the situation in management. Uh, and you said that one of the big problems is that the FCC hasn't had adequate data. But if you did have data, uh, how would you move forward with that? What are uh, the limits that the FCC has in terms of uh, trying to affect change in, a, you know, in private companies that way in terms of their management? Yeah, you know, uh, what, what the courts, obviously the courts have said, uh, and in particular, when you're always getting into race specific uh, identifiers, we always have to be conscious, we always have to be uh, very clear and intentional 
Uh, but as I said, we have a statutory mandate to collect these rules. What happened is that the issue of confidentiality uh, is what uh, stalled this out some, some years ago. And so, uh, you know, I want to, I don't want to prejudge any of this. Uh, as I said, an NPRM is out there. Uh, I think, I, I, you know, I think folks raising that there's a constitutional question with, with asking about the constitutional issues here, that's problematic to me. Uh, I think we should be able to fully move forward and start to understand what the ramifications of, uh, uh, of this would be um, moving forward. Uh, and again, with regard to confidentiality, you know, I do take it. Uh, this, this data previously was uh, publicly available. Um, you know, whether it was going to be used um, uh, in, a, in an enforcement capacity is something that the courts have war warned us against. Uh, and so making sure that we do uh, deal with the confidentiality issues, deal with what our folks have raised the specter of there being constitutional issues. I'm happy to take all those on develop a record and let us move forward so that we can fulfill our statutory obligations to make sure, uh, again, what I do also see uh, from my uh, aperture, so many uh, large uh, TV uh, and, and journalism and broadcasting issues talking about um, uh, longstanding practices that have fallen down on making sure that there is, is representation uh, in, in, the, in the newsroom, in the production room. I think this is, again, an issue that we are going to have to focus on. It is, again, an issue of, of fairness and equity, and we're going to have to meet our statutory obligations here. Hmm. What do you think is the outlook for uh, Next Gen TV? What will the FCC do to support or encourage TV stations to implement ATSC 3.0? You know, I think 3.0 is obviously, you know, one of the most exciting uh, new advancements. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think it is, of course, going to be industry led uh, it, as it has been for some time. I think there are some issues, some 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 issues on the horizon of, um, yeah. you know, privacy where we're talking about the interactive advertising that we're hearing about. Uh, obviously, um, uh, you know, a number of folks are, are very interested in, in, uh, in, in developing this. You know, one of the other concerns is how are we going to transition folks, uh, especially those who aren't going to be able mm -hmm. to necessarily uh, afford a, a new TV, um, especially now given all of the um, setbacks that we see amongst a number of American households. So there are a number of things to think through, but I think it's a very exciting time. Uh, I'm interested to see what this technology uh, will develop. One additional thing that I wanted to go back to, especially talking about media ownership, EEO, and some of those issues, you know, obviously, uh, you know, post, um, post Prometheus, uh, you know, we also saw uh, in particular, uh, one of my Republican colleagues, um, um, you know, talking about we should move expeditiously with the incubator. You know, obviously that is something um, you know, the, the, I, I think we should have all ideas on the table. Uh, I do think obviously the, the incubator um, uh, was a good idea. I think what you saw the challenge from a number of organizations was, was in the execution and the implementation of the incubation idea. Uh, and so I, that, all of these as well are things that we're going to have to think through and wrestle with. Uh, but I am glad to see that on, on the other side, my colleagues are also uh, thinking of ways that we can revive and work through issues of, uh, of diversity moving forward. How has it been working with the uh, Republican commissioners under a 2-2 split? Yes, it's been a fascinating time, uh, you know, uh, uh, working on, obviously I was a minority commissioner before uh, as a Democrat on, mm -hmm. on, on, a, on a, a, a Trump um, in a Jeep pie led uh, commission. Uh, and so 2-2 two, two has its own interesting um, uh, dynamics to it. Uh, but, but like I said, I, I think more than anything, uh, we were given very clear bipartisan legislative uh, priorities. Uh, and that was to get the EBB effect, you know, up and running as quickly as possible. The acting chairwoman has said uh, that program is gonna be set to launch uh, May 12th, which by my calendar means tomorrow. Um, uh, as well as, um, uh, you know, the ECF, the Emergency Connectivity Fund, uh, is something as well where we were given 
a very quick burn uh, by, by, by Congress. And I, I fully believe that those were the right decisions uh, because uh, you know this is an emergency. This pandemic and getting greater connectivity, in particular the EBB focuses on low income uh, individuals. Uh, the ECF is focused on, on our youngest learners. Um, and so these are, you know, for those who, who know, um, uh, you know, the playing field here, our universal service fund regularly, annually is about a $10 billion um, uh, program, uh, a $10 billion fund that does about four things that everybody knows. But what you can see is over $3 billion for EBB mm. and $7 billion for the emergency connectivity fund. We've been given basically $10 billion very quickly. Uh, to help power everyday American households uh, through this very challenging time with the pandemic. Uh, and so um, mm. I have been glad to see that, that all of those have been 4-0. Uh, again, those were legislatively bipartisan as well. And so I've been glad to see that we have effectuated the, the guidance and the guidelines that Congress has outlined for us, done so on a bipartisan basis uh, and expeditiously. Well, we have one time for one more question. Uh, I know that you had uh, hosted a couple of virtual roundtables with the presidents of historically black um, colleges and universities. And uh, I'm sure a lot of that had to do with affordability of broadband and so forth. But what were some of the key points that you learned from these presidents? It must have been fascinating. Yes, it was. It was fascinating. I, I would love to uh, I, I'll, I'd love to come back and tell you and, and folks more about it, uh, Rick. But, and, and I have enjoyed this today. Thank you to everybody for joining and hearing a little bit of, of what I'm thinking about and what my priorities are. Uh, and thank you again for, uh, for the invitation, Rick and, and Chairman Wiley. Um, and so to the question, uh, you know, what I really heard was a couple different things. Um, you know, obviously HBCUs continue to be underfunded uh, with the pandemic. And we've seen this throughout universities across the United States. Students had to were, were, were you know almost a, a diaspora where students were going back to wherever they came from. They weren't on college campuses, and so when you have students going back to where they came from, uh, obviously for a number of uh, students of color uh, of African American students, when they're going back to um, in many cases where they lived in the South, uh, and in a lot of cases when they're going back to their household. Some of those are very low income uh, households that aren't connected. And so getting them to be able to finish their studies has got to be our highest priority. HBCUs uh, graduate the highest number of students of color in particular African-American students. Uh, and so making sure that they had the connectivity again and, and they, have, they disproportionately are Pell Grant students. Pell Grant students is obviously one of the categories that we said was going to allow folks to get emergency broadband benefit. So, uh, you know, a lot of these issues kind of uh, coalesce. You know, the last thing that I would say that I heard very clearly uh, from HBCU presidents is that these HBCUs truly are pillars of their communities. Uh, and so making sure that they remain healthy, uh, that they do continue um, uh, to, to, to provide jobs and an environment and an ecosystem that comes around them, in particular, the, the number of them that are in the South, uh, these are really important issues that are going to have to be worked through and, uh, and, and proud to continue that dialogue with those presidents because this is a, a, a mission critical issue, especially for uh, communities of color. Oh, thank you, Commissioner. We're very grateful to have, for, for you joining us today. Thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to be with Great. us. Great presentation. And thank you for your candid answers on so many of these issues. And thank you for all the, your leadership role on so many of these uh, very critical issues that are they're facing the, the media industry these days. So we, we thank you very much. And uh, uh, we welcome you back here anytime. So Great, thank you, Commissioner. And we want to thank our sponsors for being with us today. A uh, special thanks to Dave Arlen of Arlen Communications and his team, John Taylor of LG Electronics, and our chairman of the board, Mr. Dick Wiley. So we look forward to seeing you back here on June 22nd with our speaker, Gary Shapiro of CTA. Meanwhile, thank you for joining us today. We appreciate your support. Thank you. Thank you to our guest speaker today, and a big thank you again to our sponsors. We'll see you next month.